My name's Tipper, and today we're going to be talking about Appalachian language, specifically Appalachian words and phrases that start with the letter H. For reference, I use the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English. Now, that's a, a book that's out of print, so it's very expensive. However, there's a new version of it you can find on Amazon and also on the... Um, the publisher site. I'll put those links down below in the description. And the name of it is the Su Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English. So you can check both of those out. And we're going to start with the word hack. Hack. So hack is a verb. It's to annoy, embarrass. Capehart Word List 1917 documented it. It was to annoy or nettle. Nettle. Like if you nettle someone. Kind of like needle. Needle someone. Uh, that joke hacks Steve to this day. 1940, Aswell Glossary, Tennessee, is to deflate or take down a peg. So if you hacked someone, I guess that you were taking them down a notch or a peg. Maybe you were, they, they thought they were being uh, something more than they were and you showed that they were not. 1974, Fink's Bits of Mountain Speech to annoy and embarrass. That sure, story sure did hack him. That story sure did hack him. So this is a word that I'm not familiar with at all, that usage. So please, if you are familiar with it, let me know. Now the next one is a phrase, and I'm very familiar with it. It's beyond common. I probably literally say it on a daily basis, and it's had ought to. So had ought to is a verb phrase, means should. Instead of saying you should do that, we say you ought, had ought to is the way we would say it. So 1904, Cape Art Notebooks, a feller ought to have a good crowing rooster. So a feller ought to, but they're shortening it to order, have a good crowing roos rooster. 1937, Hall Collection, Cades Cove, Tennessee, you order see them, law. So you ought to see them. Uh, you had ought to see them, but they're, they're decreasing it to that one kind of mispronunciation. 1979, Carpenter, Walton War. Now you hadn't ought to talk like that, Ellie, the man said as the doctor went through the door. So hadn't ought to or had ought to. That's very common in my area of Appalachia. The next one is half runner bean. That's a noun, a rambling type of green bean. So 1972 just says it was documented in Cock County, Tennessee, and Jefferson County, Tennessee, and Sevier County, Tennessee. 1986, 13 of 22 people uh, were familiar with that. 1996, foods and recipes, Smoky Mountain horticulture includes a lengthy litany of legumes, crease back, cut short, cornfield beans, bunch beans, pink or peanut beans, greasy beans, sulfur beans, and half runners. 1996 through 97, Montgomery Collection, known to eight consultants. So half runner beans, the most popular bean probably that's grown in my area of Appalachia is a white half runner. So that's just beyond common, the half runner beans. Half runner beans grow uh, to be very long, so they and they grow, they twine and grow up, so they need support. They need something to grow up, um, and they are just very prolific in my area of Appalachia. That was a preferred green bean for Granny and Pap when I was growing up, was white half runners. Hallway. How, hallway is a noun, an open passage between two buildings. So you're probably thinking, well, yeah, we, we still use hallway today, and we do. I have a hallway in my house. I kind of, behind the camera here, there's a small hallway going under an arch in my garden uh, between two raised beds. You could call that a hallway. Hallways are, are beyond common across the world, of course. In this instance, they're, let me read you the uh, actual citation, and you'll better understand how they're using it. 1939 Hall Collection, Smoke Mount, North, Smoke Mount, North Carolina. They come a big rain and wash the old footbridge plumb into the hallway between the barns. That was Mrs. Bill Brown. 1956 Hall Collection, Bryson City, North Carolina. The main or living room of the house. In the old log houses, the rooms were built separately and detached as the family needed more room but were covered usually with a common roof. Often an open hallway, sometimes called a breezeway, separated two such linked log houses. 
and that was Granville Calhoun that was uh, documented saying that. So hallway, you can see that. It's just like, think of two buildings beside each other in like a little breezeway or a covered area. Most often I've heard the usage instead of when it's talking about houses, instead of hallway is dog trot. You'll hear of dog trot houses. So Pap told me when he was growing up, they lived in a dog trot house, which meant that their kitchen was separate from their living quarters. And the reason they would do that in those days is because there was so such a chance of fire uh, because of cooking with wood um, that if you fire happened a lot more often then than it does now house fires so if that part burned hopefully you could get out the rest of your stuff or get the fire put out before it took over the whole structure so they give like a little separation there also because that stove was hot so you were in there in the kitchen cooking especially can you imagine cannon it heated it up so much so then if you had like a breezeway or a dog trot between the houses and then the other side wouldn't get as hot of course you know in the days prior to uh, any kind of air conditioning or anything like that and actually one of Pap's houses when he was um, he was still living at home but he was out of the Marines he'd been so he'd been released from the Marines so he was basically an adult their house did burn and there was no saving it and he lost a lot of his his Marine uniform and that kind of stuff so that those things happen more often then but those hallways or dog trots was a way to try to help prevent that the next one is hand. A person with reference to an individual's skill, suitability, or desire for a certain activity, especially with at or to in such phrases as a good hand to. 1925, Dargan, Highland Annals. Well, maybe it is, but Uncle Nath wasn't no hand to set at home by himself. 1926, Honeycutt, 20 years. Andrew, being a good hand to skin and dress coons, he proposed that he would skin and dress the coons. 1937, the Hall Collection, Ravensford, North Carolina. She's an awful hand to fish. That meant she's crazy about fishing. So I'm very familiar with that. Pap used that a lot. So that uh, someone might say about Corey and Katie, they're good hands at making music or um, maybe about someone who hunts, like the coons. He's good hand at hunting, so he'll probably bring home some meat for supper. So using a like hand to describe uh, someone, a person that was actually gonna do an activity that they were good at is really common, even now, still in the area of Appalachia that I live in. That one though, hand, I really like that one because in my mind when I read that, I could just hear Pap saying, so-and-so's a good hand at doing this or that. Um, so that was one that he used a lot. This next one is handwrite. It's a noun. It's handwriting. Style of penmanship. 1973, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park documented. They was 60 words wrote and they was two handwrites. So some, there were 60 words written down and someone could tell by looking at it. There was two separate handwrites meant two different people had had written it now that one's not common today uh, in Appalachia at all handwrites my favorite use of that though is in a song that Corey and Katie sing um, sometimes called the blackest my black the blackest crow sometimes called my dearest deer I will link to a video of, of them singing it down below it is a beautiful beautiful old ballad and it has a line in it about by your handwrite so it's talking about handwriting, which is really uh, a powerful, moving song. So I'll link to that, and you can go check it out on their channel. Hanker after. Have you ever hankered after something? So if you hanker after something, that's a verb phrase. And it says, 1975, Luntsford, it used to be, the word hanker means a person kind of has a desire for something, for friendship, or for some kind of chance in a trade, or if he admires some young lady, they say, he has a kind of kind of hankering after her. I would hear it more used instead of in the ways of love. It may be, boy, I've got a hankering for a peach pie. I think I'm going to make one. Uh, or I've got a hankering for some good fresh corn. I'm going to go down the road and see if Tim will sell me some. Those That kind of hankering more in relation to, um, to something like that, something a physical item instead of like love. 
there's all I mean it I'm sure there's a book somewhere there's all kinds of words and phrases used to talk about whiskey or moonshine in Appalachia so this is a funny one happy juice so happy juice is illegal homemade whiskey 1977 Shields Cades Cove the church was not used for these events perhaps because in many instances happy juice was passed around and this could not be done at church so happy juice happy juice is just one on a long list of moonshine or whiskey terms that you'll find in Appalachia hard is the next word and there's a couple of different entries or usages uh, listed for it but i'm just going to focus on the one adverb it's as an adverb severely roughly or harshly 1913 cape art our southern highland highlanders i ain't i ain't that hard pushed yet i ain't that hard pushed yet 1956 hall collection cosby tennessee people lived hard there was no work or money in circulation. About what they made is what they had. That was Reuben Williamson. 1962 Hall Collection, Townsend, Tennessee. Uncle Noah Birchfield was one of the most highly honored men of this county because of his integrity and character. He was hard down on lawlessness. He was 10 year old when the Civil War came on. That was John Oliver. So hard one of the first ones that that one's still very common in my area of Appalachia that that I comes to mind something I might have said to the girls when they were young or when I thought they needed a, an attitude adjustment an attitude adjustment I might tell them now I'm going to talk hard to you now listen to me because I'm going to talk hard to you and it's going to be hard to hear you know giving them like a, a warning you better pay attention because I'm about to talk hard to you so that one's still common uh, hard to mean severely or roughly or harshly in my area of Appalachia. Go right along with that one with the hard. This is a hard feeling. So if you have a hard feeling is noun, uh, is a noun, bitterness, animosity between people. 1956, um, some dial, North Carolina, ill, feeling. 1999 Montgomery collection there was real hard feeling between the Cardwells and Joneses and that was by Cardwell so that one's still uh, common here if two people get in a fight maybe they don't get over it easy uh, I, I use Corey and Katie for a, an example again sometimes they get in a fight and there's hard feelings between them lucky for them it never lasts long and then it dissipates and goes away since they were little kids me and Matt's always uh, joked it's not so much like that today but when they were little it was one of two ways they were either fisticuffs there was fights going on because there were so many hard feelings or there was such annoying um, overly lovey-dovey stuff going on that got on your last nerve so it was one or the other so they it's not so much like that today but but sometimes they do fuss and there's hard feelings that's the same as uh, with anyone else but like i said luckily they don't stay mad long they get over it another one for hardly hard is hardly so hardly is an adverb in constructions of multiple negation multiple negation so all you grammar people will understand that better than i do 1939 Hall Collection, Catalucci, North Carolina. We didn't know hardly what to think. That was Mrs. Will Palmer. Palmer, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. There wasn't any hardly at all. And that was E.W. Dogden. Dogden. 1974, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I'm hoarse. I can't hardly sing, but that's the best I could do. So all of those are exactly what I would say today. I'm hoarse. I can't hardly talk. Or... I, I, I didn't know hardly what to think when he said that. I couldn't believe it. Or I was shocked. So all those, that one is still really common in my area of Appalachia and things I would say on a daily basis. So going back to that hard feeling that I was talking about a minute ago when you're in a fuss with somebody and you get hard feelings and you have to make up and get over it. There's also hardness. So that same kind of ill feeling and resentment that can develop and it turns into a hardness between people. So feeling toward another, animosity, resentment, used as both a count and an abstract noun. So 1980, uh, 1895, excuse me, Edison and Fairchild, Tennessee Mountains. There's a right smart of hardness between them two boys. So they'd been in a fight. Hopefully they got over it really quick like my girls do. 1917, Cape Art Word List. It means ill, ill feeling. Hardness is an ill feeling. It's likely to get up right smart of hardness between them. 
1940 Hall Collection, White Oak, North Carolina. There was some hardness between them. That was Carl Messer. 1956, Chapman Folk Retain. When mountain people dislike each other, there is said to be a hardness between them. Here's one that I'm not familiar with, but it's kind of comical, is a hard tail. A hard tail is a mule. So 1967, a joking name for mule, that was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 1995 through 97, Montgomery Collection, it was known to Adams, Bush, Jones, Norris, and Shield, so a hard tail. You can see mules can be very stubborn. You've heard that, stubborn as a mule. So I'm sure that's where the hard tail, where that saying come about, but I've never heard that one. So the next one is harp sing or harp singing, and that's a noun. It says see also, so it's also called old harp, old harp singing, singing, or just singing school. So in 1926, Willie, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, we spent an hour in the village church listening to the harp singing, a service held there once a year and most impressive. The congregation consisted of about 100 men, typical of this mountain region, when they sang, it was with heart and soul, the right hand keeping tune and the melody, mostly from the voices of men, such as only possible to those attuned to nature. Each hymn had a separate leader. There was no musical instrument. The leader used the old style tuning fork and hummed the tune before the hymn was sung. The hymn book was entitled The New Harp of Columbia. A new system of musical notation with a note for each sound and a shape for each note, containing a variety of most excellent hymn tunes, odes, and anthems, happily adapted to church service, singing schools, and societies. So if you've never heard um, old harp singing or singing school kind of music, it's really beautiful. It's really haunting and really beautiful. Now, I did not grow up having anything to do with that or even really knowing about it very much. And there's different types of shape note singing or old uh, harp singing that it's called. So there, there is this where they would literally sing the notes. They would really sing those. And then the other ones where it's more of a, a style like it's described here. It's, it's more complicated than what it seems on the surface is what I discovered after going to a, a shape note singing school one time. But it's fascinating. It's a beautiful traditional uh, way of singing in Appalachia and beyond in other places. But it's really haunting and beautiful if you ever get a chance to hear it, especially to be there in person to actually feel it while they're doing it. It's amazing. 1937, Hall Collection, Emirates Cove, Tennessee, Harp singing was said to go on by the hour in mountain churches. 1956, Hall Collection, Roaring Fork, Tennessee. We'd play this game, swing more at the singing school. They'd try to teach us the rudiments of music. The singing school would be held at the church house after the regular school was out. Usually it would last a week or two, at the most two weeks. You had to pay money to go there, about 25 cents or 50 cents a week for a week or two. They still have harp singing in Wares Valley in November, and that was Mr. and Mrs. E.L. Reagan. 1960, Hall, Smoky Mountain Folks, a community or church singing in which a sacred harp songbook is used. The sacred harp is a collection of psalm and hymn tunes with the music written with shape notes. 1975, um, better harp singing was once the frequent entertainment in the Great Smokies. 1978, Peterson and Phillips, New Harp of Columbia, shape note singing in East Tennessee predates the New Harp of Columbia, presently used in the traditional harp sings of the area. Strong family ties were the rule, adding to the attraction of singing schools and their successors, harp sings. So very fascinating kind of history. I don't know as much about it uh, as some other folks, but if you want a rabbit hole to go down, that's certainly one to go down with some beautiful, beautiful singing. So the next one is hateful. So hateful, adjective, superlative form, hatefulest. So hatefulest is one that I would, I would hear and use on a regular basis when talking about someone that was hateful, mean-spirited. 1940, Hans Hawks Dunn, that was the reason he was so everlasting hateful and always poking fun at other folks. 1972, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I took a young mare there that had never been shod before. She was pretty hateful. So it was a horse that was hateful there. 
of a thing, it, that was mean-spirited, the first one, and the second, of a thing, troubling or vexing. 1939, Hall Collection, Bear Traps is Hateful to Set. 1969, Medford, now this little flat field was one of the hatefulest patches to cultivate on the farm. Soured, often wet, cloddy, and hard to work. So that's interesting. He's talking about an actual piece of land that was hateful because it was hateful to work because it didn't get enough sunshine and it was cloddy and it was damp. And um, so that's, you can see how that could be used in so many different ways, the word hateful. And it, it, th that usage is still common in my area of Appalachia, for sure. So the next one is haul off. It's a verb phrase to take the initiative, get into action. 1942, Chase, Jacktails, they came up here cussing and bussing me and I had to haul off and kill them. Yikes. 1972, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, the black snake healed the copperhead out there a while and after a while he just hauled off and swallowed it. So the black snake hauled off and ate the copperhead. 1973, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, he hauled off and throwed that thing. It just went endways like that back through there, right over the children's heads that's up front and hit my sister Myrtle. So he just hauled off and threw something. So that phrase is still very common where I live in Appalachia. You might use it like, um, he just hauled off and, and moved, never said a word to nobody. Nobody even knows where he went. They said he went out west or they just hauled off and, and decided they'd take us all out to eat. You could just use it in so many different ways. It's just very common where I live. In fact, today I've just hauled off and talked all this time about Appalachian language. So I hope you've enjoyed this chat about Appalachian language. As always, I hope you'll leave a comment and tell me which words you were familiar with, which ones maybe you'd never heard of. Maybe I jogged your memory about some other words. I really enjoy the comments, so be sure to, to share any thoughts that come to mind while you were watching this. And please continue to drop back by often as we celebrate Appalachia, which includes a lot of Appalachian language.